Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for coming. And today we're going to have Nikki Buxton, the co-founder of Belize Bird Rescue, talk to us. And she and her partner moved there from England to retire, and her life ended up taking a different turn. She's going to tell us all about it. Uh, some of the video we're going to see is pre-recorded because right now it's raining quite a bit in Belize, and we want to make sure we have the, the best quality. So she did pre-record some video that she will talk to us through, and then she'll also be showing us some of the birds live. So I'm not going to say anything else so we can get started and I'm going to turn it over to you, Nikki. Hey, okay. Thank you so much for having me come chat to you guys. That's uh, great. And at any time, please, oh my gosh, <laughs> at any time, just jump in if you have any questions, because I know what it's like if you're trying to remember to say something later on. So um, I should go and get my birds, right? <laughs> Okay, all right, so as uh, Amy was saying, we moved to Belize like 18 years ago now, um, and it, the rescue kind of just sucked us in. We ended up buying two baby parrots from the pet trade here because we didn't realize it was a problem, we didn't realize it was illegal even, and we just couldn't bear to see these two baby parrots get put into cages for life. So. We, uh, we raised them uh, to be free birds and they joined a wild flock. And people kind of saw what we were doing and were um, surprised that we managed to do that. Apparently nobody else had done that before. And um, they brought us more and more birds and these birds were clipped, uh, had clipped feathers. They were crying like babies, barking like dogs. It was completely nuts, um, but we made it work. And after talking with the forest department, they um, agreed to give us a permit to continue doing that. And we've been doing it ever since. So um, I think we're up to over a thousand releases now of birds that would otherwise have stayed in the pet trade for their entire lives. And we're working with nine different species here in Belize. And one of them is a um, endangered bird. It's only found in Belize, it's the yellow-headed Amazon which some of you would be familiar as, um, there's, there's a few different um, subspecies of that and the double yellow head is one of them. So, um, but for the Belizean species, we are hell bent on protecting that. There's less than probably 1200 birds left in the wild here. And so we really do need to try and conserve the population. So, um, I don't know if it would be better if I played the video. That, sorry, Jerry's just come in. We're, we're kind of... <laughs> no, he can't see. They can only see your belly. There you go. <laughs> Hiya. <laughs> um, I don't know if it would be better to play the video because it's actually quite long and I can talk over that. It will give us something to look at other than my face. Um, would that sit well with you, do you think? Sure, absolutely. And then we'll find out if I've got the, the smarts to do this. So... Um, talk me through it. So I go on share screen or yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. And then what do I do? I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> Files? Files. Files from, oh, um, huh. Okay. This is interesting. No. Uh, let's go here. And then the, sorry about this. Um, it looks like you have it. I hope so. Ta da! Is that it? Yeah. What are you guys seeing? Right now we have your screen, your, uh, your um, Windows Explorer screen. So you need to click on the video to start it. It's playing. Oh, we're not seeing that. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing the video. The screen sharing is paused. Hang on. <laughs> As, why is it paused? I don't know. Works fine for resume, me. Resume share. There we go. How's that? Yeah, that's Windows Explorer. You need to have, you need to be playing. Right, so. Okay, watch this. Sorry about this. Anyway, so I could probably keep talking. You can still hear me, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, oh, there we go. You got it. Hey, wonderful. Can we start it back? Yep. Great. 
Okay, so what I did was start outside. The, the, this is our home, basically, which has become the rescue center. And you can see that the aviaries start really close to the house. Um, and that's because I'm overprotective and I like to see and hear the birds all the time. So these are two baby yellowheads that were confiscated by the forest department. You can see the one on the right particularly is exhibiting um, feather discoloration from poor diet. These guys were raised on probably corn, corn tortillas, flour tortillas, that kind of thing. And they were half the weight they should have been. And then these two had similar issues. They were blind when we got them. They still are blind. They didn't regain their sight. And that was a direct result of um, lack of um, vitamin A probably in their diet. So their retinal process is shut down. And one of them, the one on the left actually lost an entire eye because of it as well, which is really sad. So these are like our non-releasable um, sanctuary birds. Um, then if you move a little further back in the, in the rescue, um, there's a, this Avery on the left there is for our passerines, woodpeckers, toucans, things like that. Cause we don't just do parrots, although that's our speciality. And then you have all the parrot aviaries to the back there. And this is just showing you how overgrown everything has become during COVID because we don't have the people coming to do the gardening like we used to. But it's actually not a bad thing. It's a nice environment for the birds. So these are two arasaris that um, both have wing injuries that we are hoping they will um, do their own physiotherapy in this enclosure and um, get a little bit stronger. We've got three species of toucans in the country. The keel build is the biggest one and that's the national bird. These guys are the middle sized bird. There you go, he flies a bit, but not too well. Not well enough for release. And that's their sound, it's the cutest thing. <laughs> and everybody's wet from this darned rain. Um, so I hope one day we'll be able to release these, but I can't be sure. So. I went into the white front aviary and it was starting to rain. So I, I moved very quickly underneath the tin. So I'm sorry about this. You'll have to be a bit seasick for a minute because <laughs> I didn't want to get wet. Um, so what we have here in, we try and have two compartments to every aviary because it helps us segregate birds or close off certain areas if we want to catch them. Um, these mostly are the babies. The babies seem to congregate in this side. We love these roost boxes and so do they because it gives them a sense of security. And you can see from these guys, they've, they were formerly clipped and their feathers are growing back in. They've got horrible stress bars. They again had bad diet in the beginning until we got our hands on them. And that one's just grown a lovely blue feather. Um, oh, and and Nikki, uh, uh, we have a question on who built the aviaries. Um, our guys that work for us, they've um, they've gone on a very steep learning curve, and we but we've been learning as we go along. I would say we're pretty good at it now. <laughs> In an ideal world, we'd like it double wired because we don't like the idea that the birds could possibly get um, a problem from a predator through the wire. But um, for the most part, they are almost double wired because they all back onto one another. So this is, uh, this is the hatch through to the other side. You see all those guys huddled at the back there out of the rain. <laughs> we have little bits of tin here and there and they all know where it is to hide underneath. So then the rain really came down hard. <laughs> I didn't think they were interested in bathing anymore. I thought they'd had enough. And then they all flew up into the, the corner where they like to go when they want to shower. Is that too loud? Are you okay? I guess you could turn it down if you wanted to. So um, they all go up into this one section to, to bathe, which is about what they're about to start doing. There they go. <laughs> so when it rains, it really rains. It's terrible. The white fronts are the ones that are sexually dimorphic that we have here. We can tell the males from the females. The males have the red stripe in the wing, the females are just plain green. And that white pipe across there is where we um, do artificial showers in our three months dry season, which is why I think they like being in that corner for bathing. Now, I, I did this video of the ground because I wanted you to see the problem that parrots cause with the citrus industry here. This is all, some of these are windfalls because they've been pecked by woodpeckers. And some of them are windfalls because the parrots are just so mischievous and they go along and they just snip, 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 snip. 
And the citrus farmers have a massive issue with that, obviously, and they that some of them actually shoot the parrots, which is another thing that we're working on trying to find a solution for. So this is the other half of that same aviary, just to show you the the area that they have. Ideally, I would like something a lot bigger for these guys, but um, we've got what we've got right now. I think one day we'll be able to put an extension on the back and link it up to another one, which will give them a lot more space. And they, Nikki, uh, there's a question whether or not you yeah. were parrot, parrot people before going to Belize. No, not at all. <laughs> no, we, uh, we really did get sucked in. <laughs> I don't think I'd even touched a parrot. Do you I, have any mind, experience in wildlife rehab? No, not at all. No, we learned it all on the on the hop. <laughs> this is one of our released toucans who was trying to hide from the rain. So I just took the opportunity to show you this guy. He's so pretty. He's only about um, probably about like five months old, I think. So he's still a bit of a baby. Um, this Avery we use for the pet ex-pet yellowheads. Um, this one is, this is one of them. He was surrendered to us a couple of months ago, so he's new here. And uh, he's going to get company pretty soon. We're going to put those two little babies in with him. And we've got a few others that we are going to move up into the, the rehab program for release. We've released 49 ex-captive yellowheads, which is actually pretty good going because they're notoriously difficult to rehabilitate. Some of them took us eight and a half, nine years to do, which is a really good hard slog. So this is a bit more of the orchard showing you where it goes down to the, the next group of aviaries. And there's a handy cut straight to this guy who is a very difficult case. He was, I guess he was tormented and he really doesn't like people. And I don't quite know what to do with him. He's physically, he's in wonderful shape, but I want to give him a go. I want to put him with the other birds and just see if he can come around after a few years. It's a, you know how long these guys live and it's such a shame to keep them captive for so long. So we'll, we'll give that one a go. These are our two macaws that we've got. We've actually, sorry, we've got three macaws, but this is a, a couple. Um, one is a blue and gold. The one on the left is a blue and gold who was a, captive bred pet bird and the one on the right is a Catalina which is a blue and gold scarlet cross and we think he escaped from Chesimal Zoo and he was flying all over Belize oh my gosh there was huge panic because he was getting really close to the wild scarlet macaw populations and you know how easily they hybridize so luckily one of our rehabber colleagues in a different organization managed to catch him so those two are a very loving couple and they hate me which is fine <laughs> so you can hear the crazy aviaries here this area is um i these guys again they i think they were tormented kept too long in cages i don't know what to do with them um i'm slowly fostering birds like this out because it's not effective for me to feed them and look after them and it would be better if they had homes. So. Those two in the middle, they're both missing wing tips. Otherwise they'd be perfect for release, but they can't fly, which is such a shame. Yeah, so crazy noisy. You see a fallen tree. We've had a hurricane and two tropical storms back to back. It's been an awful season for the weather, so. I'm afraid the place looks terrible, but that's a, a hazard of living in this, this part of the world. So these are the parakeets. Uh, we have the olive throated parakeet here, and we have coated these cages in palm fronds because they were being harassed almost to panic by a, a big raptor. It was a, um, gosh, I've forgotten the name of the, raptor now, uh, the forest falcon. And he was just slamming into the cage trying to get these guys. So we had to cover it in palms. So these were ex-pets that can be rehabilitated. And then we have another enclosure with ones that cannot be released because they've got broken wings or fractures that never healed. And Nikki, you, and you, also, are, oh, you also have some hmm? non-native birds too, right? 
Uh, yeah, oh, the, I see. Um, the blue and gold in the yeah, the blue and gold in the Catalina are not native. Um, we've got a Moluccan cockatoo too. These uh, are red lords. They're so cute. <laughs> this is probably the one we see most of now. Um, again, we have this smaller enclosure that goes through. It has a hatch through to the big aviary, and um, these normally come um, as babies. They usually clipped. We usually get them from ha having gone through the poacher's hands and into. You can see this guy's clipped on this side. Um, so they've been captive for a little while. They're in poor condition. So it takes us. Um, it's it's a two year process before we can release these guys. And I'm afraid this little part of the video drags on a bit because I it took me a while to find some birds, but <laughs> they love this foliage and they hide in it. Do you have a, a vet that you work with? Yeah, um, we have a vet in Belize City, which is a hundred mile round trip. So that's not fun. Um, but he's excellent. He's really, really good. And uh, he's fixed no end of broken bones and re for release, which has been great. We also have vets come down to stay with us from the States and Canada, but not this year. We haven't had anybody come since March, obviously. It's just uh, it's been very unfortunate. And we haven't had interns and our staff have been on short time because of financial and health reasons. You know, just trying to minimize contact. That must be uh, quite a lot of work to get everyone fed. It's baby season, yeah. Um, apart from, a, I had a friend stay for a month and he helped me raise a lot of the parrots, but the three month baby season, I was by myself, which I lost some weight. <laughs> uh, but, um, so yeah, the, um, the red lords, we have to be careful when we're doing the releases here with the, the same with the white fronts because there's so many of them. There's like 52 birds in this aviary, believe it or not. And they pair up. And the last thing we want to do is separate a pair and cause any um, separation anxiety issues. And because we release on site, then they are hanging onto the side of the aviary and it becomes a predation issue, which is also a problem. Um, we banned every single one of our parrots. We put on a clo an, an open band and then um, we can track who they are and what their health issues are, how long they've been with us. And periodically we'll catch everybody up, check them all over and then release whoever is ready to go. Hopefully having figured out who's bonded to who. <laughs> That's just to show you the river running through our aviary right now <laughs> from the rain. It's crazy. <laughs> So uh, this is the blue head mealy, which is the biggest of the Amazons we have and probably the longest lived. These three got left behind from the, the flock that we released. Uh, we released a flock of 12 and these three are not flighted and this one has foot issues. So they're here to stay, but they become, they're a nice happy little group and they become, if we get any babies in, they're very good conspecifics to put the babies with, which, uh, is always important. We never mix the species because if you release them and they've imprinted on the wrong species, then we're in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> Very cute. They're supposed to be the most gentle of parrots, I think, from what I heard. And I don't quite know why I videoed this part, but <laughs> it's just showing you the pathway around the aviary. So, and that takes a couple of seconds, done. All right, Pionus. I love these guys. They're so pretty and so different from everybody else. Um, I, I'm guessing you're familiar with them as well. But uh, this is the white crowned Pionus. We've got three. We've only got three this year, but we have a flock of now 19 that we've released that come by on a regular basis. And once their clipped wings grow out, then we should be able to release them probably in the next few months they'll be going because they're behavior wise they'll just they'll just join the flock they'll be fine do you do That's soft releases for everybody or a mixture of soft and hard releases um the yellow heads we hard release and the, sorry start again the we only ever soft release parrots but the yellow heads and the blue heads we have to take off site we don't have any in this area so we have uh, release sites for those this is a, a brief look at our water bird enclosure. We do um, 
seabirds and um, wading birds. And at the moment, we've got a little mixed bag in there of that little gull at the front. There's a one-winged pelican. Don't ask me how we ended up with a one-winged pelican. It was a long story of it was supposed to be transferred for long-term care to the zoo or another facility, and then COVID happened, so he's still here. And that little guy wobbling there is a red-foot booby, which Belize has the only white morph breeding colony of. And then there's a, an egret there, which is very well camouflaged at the back on the left. And he had a wing fracture and it's beautifully healed. So he'll be being released very soon. And that's just a little advice, so like distant look at the Averys. Um, and I think, I don't touch this in case I break it. <laughs> There's some house birds up there, which I think we'll be able to take you around to look. I don't know, am I able to join on a different device so I can walk around? Is that possible? So this is, um, I went in, back into the parakeet Avery because I completely forgot what I'd already videoed and I'm no good at editing. And that little guy is just so cute. I don't know if um, Jerry is still online. If he's online and he can hear me, maybe he should be joining with his phone so, so that he how, can walk how around. How many aviaries do you have there? It's, um, it's 37, 38, something like that. Ah, that's um, incredible. I mean, yeah, there's, there's I mean how do you take care of everybody? It's just- uh, um, At the moment, I'm not doing the best job possible, again, because of uh, limited staff. And Oscar and his dad, Orlando, have been coming in. And they're normally in on a much, much regular basis, more regular basis, and they- um, they do the perching and enrichment, but um, that's slid a little bit this last month or so with this weather. You know, nobody wants to go out in this rain. And to be honest, the birds are kind of hunkering down and miserable, so. Oh, and we have a question. What, uh, what predators do you encounter? I know you mentioned the forest falcon. Uh, we have, another... yeah, foxes, raccoons, possums, snakes, um, and then lots of birds of prey. So. It's uh, oh, it's not so fun. You, you get snakes into the aviaries then? Hopefully not. We shouldn't do. <laughs> but for the release birds, it's an issue. So this actually, this aviary is where the wilder yellowheads are. These are the babies we hand raised. And that is more like a wild noise, believe it or not. And we now, have a question about, um, well, you, you may be able to talk about this afterwards, about how much food you put out, you put uh, native foods in the enclosure, or do they eat any of the plants there? And how much food do you go through in a week or a month? Huh. Right, we use um, $80 a day worth of food. And we do have to buy an awful lot of stuff. We've got stuff growing on the farm, but it's nothing like enough to sustain them. Um, because we've got 200 birds right now. So that's quite a lot to feed and um, we get we have to you, uh, sorry I give them like I give them cooked corn and I give them some flower seeds and then they get coconut um, the local apples bananas papaya watermelon um, pumpkin and carrots and veggies and like that we do beans chickpeas um, and um, we can also get a pellet here. We can get the Missouri pellet, which they don't like very much, but I make it into a cake, which they do like. And um, eggs, we cook up eggs with pasta sometimes for them and stuff like that. And so, then uh, uh, the, the seabirds, uh, probably they need fish and fish. some other specialized foods too. Fish is a problem and it's been a problem this, this year as well. Um, and that's expensive, that's... Uh, Gosh, I've forgotten now. I'm probably looking at $20 a day in fish right now for these guys. Um, that's, that's a lake that shouldn't be there <laughs> from this rain. Crazy. So, and these are the raptors. We actually breed our own food for the raptors. I'm not going to go into that because that's not pleasant for anybody to think about. But um, so the rain started again. That's our creek that we can normally swim in. It's a beautiful, crystal clear, idyllic little bubbling brook and now it's a torrent with trees growing in the middle of it <laughs> that's actually flooded the local village and I just wanted to quickly show you a couple of our raptors I know 
that's not really a focus, but um, this is a juvenile black hawk that somebody thought they'd clip his wings and keep him as a pet. So we've just been hanging on to him until those, those regrow. And he's almost there. He, he turns around and shows me that he's almost there now. There's a few missing. So I think we're very close, which is great. We don't interact with these guys. We feed them and then we walk away. And then this one, we see so many of these because they are a problem in Belize City. They live in people's roofs, they're barn owls. He's in the top left-hand corner because I scared him. There he goes. And um, this one had a wing fracture, which probably was, he probably hit a car, um, but the vet in Belize City has done a fabulous job and he'll be being released as soon as this weather calms down. And that is a alarm call from a brown jay who didn't like what he saw just now. <laughs> and it, at some point, I would love to hear about how you interact with law enforcement and uh -huh. regulatory people and all that, and you know about the training that you give them and uh, mm -hmm. you know, them bringing you birds and all that. Right. Kind of stuff. Okay. Well, I, actually, the video is finished, so that was. Um, do I stop share? I think. That's it. So there you are. That was a quick walk around BBR. Um, a bit manic, but <laughs> um, there you go. Um, yeah, For in terms of the law enforcement, about four years ago, we did a, a program, actually more than that now, five years ago, we did a program with the Forest Department. We went to them and said that this isn't working. You're confiscating a few here and there, but you're not being consistent. And it's not fair because you'll take from the poor people and you'll leave the rich people alone. And we're not having that and we're not working with you anymore if you're not going to fix this. So we devised a license program where people who have had a bird for a long time can keep it if they apply to uh, apply minimum standards to that bird of care and husbandry and everything. Um, and if they don't comply, then the bird is confiscated. And if it's a baby, it's confiscated. So that's where we're at now, hopefully, moving on to the point where all new birds will get confiscated. But we've, uh, we've had a little glitch in that, but I'm hoping it's going to be revived next year. So do, do birds get brought to you from all over the entire country? Yeah, absolutely they do. Um, I'm, we're looking at 50% confiscation, 50% surrender. Um, and yes, they come from the far north to the deep south and everywhere in between. But um, more often than not, people just call. They haven't got the resources or um, the time to bring them, and they just expect us to run and get them, which is fine. You know, that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, does Does anyone in Belize do parrot rehab besides you? No, um, there is a, a center that does. Um, she she has raptors. It, it's called a raptor center. So she has ambassador birds, and she does a bit of rehab. But other than that, every everything comes here. That's everything. Nice. So you probably haven't had a vacation in what fifteen years or. Um, actually, years I did. Ago. Like five, six years ago, I managed to get a trip to Dubai when Jerry had a job out there. So, but that's the last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. happy if I get a morning in bed now. <laughs> That's tremendous. Oh, we have a question. Do you give tours so, to individuals or pre-arranged groups? We actually had a, um, uh, we had a small bed and breakfast before COVID closed that down. So we had people stay and they could interact on a level with certain birds and help us do the food. And everything, as Jerry just said, we put out, it's actually near a 52, 55 trays, I think. Um, so they, could, they, they come on a, like a, a working holiday they want to help chop food and carry it out to the birds and everything and then yes we'll give like very select tours of small groups of people the reason being we can't have too much interaction with these parrots they're supposed to be trying to be wild and the more people they see the less wild they become which is why we keep those baby yellowheads in that aviary where i had to walk through the bush there we keep them far away they're never part of any tour and people don't get to go down there at all good Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And um, you're, you've got some birds you want to show us in your building too, right? Yeah. I was kind of hoping that Jerry would be able to fire up his phone. <laughs> I don't know if you heard me earlier and whether he got online. Did you manage that, Jerry? Because I've been told over and over that the camera on my phone is terrible. So you can't see what's going on. Well, Jerry's in chat, so I think he's hearing you. 
Oh, she's coming with it. Had to download Zoom on it. Okay, uh -huh. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, so while we're going for Jerry, um, would mm -hmm. you like to tell us more about the history of things or we can let people, a lot of people are writing into chat for questions. So I think if anybody wants to unmute and ask some questions while we're waiting for the in-house tour, you know, just go ahead, un unmute yourself while you're asking the question and then mute yourself again so that we don't get feedback. No questions. <laughs> Hi, it's Diane. Um, I'm with the Long Island Parrot Society. How are you funded? How do you pay for all of this? Uh, people like you, actually. Um, we've been doing an awful lot of begging since March, <laughs> since our income source dried up. You know, theoretically, the hotel was supposed to be a um, sustainable funding source for the bed and breakfast, for the um, rescue. But since that was closed in March, we've had existing solely on donations from yourself. Well, Parrot Trust have been really good with us. Um, we managed to get a small local grant as well um, to help us with the COVID relief. But other than that, it's private donations. I will send out something when we're done. Uh, I can also put it in chat about with their website and there, there are many ways to donate. You can obviously give cash. You, know, you can um, designate them on Amazon and, uh, and I give and uh, my, my personal favorite, I've been uh, buying off of the Amazon wish list, which I find very addictive, paired with, um, with the Honey app, which tells me when there are drops in prices on things so I can scoot in there and buy that. So uh, Belize Bird Rescue, like so many places right now, of course, is really suffering and needs all the help they can get. So I will give you guys the resources if you'd like to like to donate. Rosie shaking and saying, yes, please do. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but yeah, you know, they, they all need help now. And um, it's kind of mm -hmm. you know, like a two-person show there right now. So um, can you tell us more about your educational activities with the community outside of COVID? Uh, obviously, right now, we know you're not, you're not able to do yeah. anything. But... Right, outside of COVID, yes. We used to go into the schools and do talks with the kids because I... The biggest problem we've got here with um, Belize, Belize is very focused on religion, um, and that's the main link. If they're telling a story, it's got to be a Bible story. So I actually wrote a small children's book to try and get some empathy into these kids because they don't learn, they don't pick up a Spot the Dog storybook. They don't put personalities into animals the way that we do when we were raised. Um, and that's something that we're trying to rectify. It's not just us, lots of organizations are doing that too. And I think it's working. I feel like the, the empathy of kids now is, is beginning to, to step up to the point where they think and they do have souls and they do have um, feelings. So that's one aspect. Plus we go out and do public awareness with adults. And so just so they know that if they well, they know who to call. And uh, because to be quite honest, Forest Department barely pick up the phone. So we are the main like order call for most wildlife, to be quite honest. And then we'll farm it out to the right organization. Nikki, does, yeah. do, do you have an international airport? And how far away from it are you? We do. Um, it's in Belize City, so it's 50 miles away, which isn't too bad. Um, the only problem with Belize City Airport is um, I think all the flights bar a couple co have to come through the States or through Canada. So flights from Europe are very limited and flights from South America and Central America are limited. But for you guys, that wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> yeah, but the flights are expensive. I'll give you that. Um, that, that leg from the States to Belize is terrible. It's, it's way overpriced, but that's because it's a small airport and they have to run small planes. So it's not profitable. You get it? Yeah. I think Jerry's still working on it. Oh, hey, he's giving me the phone. So is it, can you see this? Gone away again. Yeah, I think you'll need to, you'll need to, oh, let me make Jerry a co-host too. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of a Zoom call. Pick up the 
<laughs> okay, Jerry. Jerry's phone is now a co-host, so you can you can share the screen again. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. All right, I'm going to give this back to Jerry because I don't know what I'm doing here. Jerry. Yeah. I can't make it work. Well. Yeah, yeah, Either that or I'll just move my laptop around. I wanted to, I really wanted to take you outside and show you the birds outside because they're so cute. Oh, is it working now? Well, they can probably see me. Can they see you? <laughs> All right. But uh, I don't know how to switch the cameras around. Um, usually. That way. Oh, I'm in one of the bedrooms. <laughs> it's right. the only place with a blank wall. How's that? This is our house. Um, Where? I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see your camera right now. Oh, shoot. You need to do screen sharing. Right. All right. Thanks for Okay, I'll come back while he fixes that. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. I made him a co-host, so he should be able to to screen share. Okay. So yeah, we release a, um, an awful lot of parrots on site, and they stick around. We feed them. We give them supplemental food, and we uh, encourage them to stay around because it's safe here. And then, um, so in the evenings and mornings, they come in for food on the veranda, which is a, a nice thing for the hotel guests to see, but it's also nice for us because we can keep track of them. But we've probably got about a flock of 100 white fronts that come around now. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. 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 So and they you, <laughs> you don't have a problem with poaching on your property, right? No, no, touch wood. Not yet. <laughs> no, we've been all right. No, the, the, um, we we see it's nice because we band we put a metal band on all our birds like i said so with an id number um and then when we see them come back the parents will come back with two unbanded birds then we know that they've been breeding which is fantastic that's the definition of success <laughs> wonderful do you, mm -hmm. do you ever have school groups come on the property oh no gosh <laughs> No, I mean, a lot of these birds, when they've been in cages and been in houses as well, they respond right, really strongly to children. And that's the last thing we want. So we try and cut that off. Yeah, that's my excuse anyway. Now, uh, you, now you, you had mentioned uh, last time I saw you that you, you also help train like the forest rangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they don't get the opportunity to do any handling. So if they have to go and confiscate a bird, especially if they have an owner that's not interested in helping them, or they've got a bird, an aggressive, imagine a big aggressive yellowhead in a small cage. Some of these cages, we literally have to cut them open with wire cutters because they've been put through this tiny door and then they've got big in there and then they can't get out. Um, so these guys have to know how to hold a bird without damaging themselves or hurting the bird. Plus, they don't know the program. They tend, because, because we wrote it, we know it. Um, so we can teach it so much better than anybody else can too. We don't have the, break, we don't have broken telephone going on through, <laughs> through multiple training. <laughs> yeah, you, you've mentioned about confiscating. I'm not sure if you ever came right out and told us what the, the actual Belizean law is concerning um, having captive birds. It's absolutely forbidden. You can't. To it at all you're not um, the wildlife laws are very very simple and very strict and it says right at the top of the wildlife act you can't um touch handle molest hunt kill remove or um mess with any species of wildlife eggs feathers or anything full stop it's quite unequivocal i've lost you there we go. Sorry. Uh, so that's just native birds, right? That doesn't, if someone has a, a budgie, um, that's allowed or. Budgies are different. Budgies are, uh, are being bred in the country. And in a way it's good because we're encouraging people to get budgies, not local parrots. Um, but it's also bad because budgies are notoriously delicate. Oh, this is Jerry now. He's, he's going to show you the outside birds. Yeah, the budgies are notoriously delicate, so it's um, it's unfortunate. I get a lot of uh, calls for sick budgies, and it's usually too late by the time I get that. It's Jujubee. <laughs> oh, all right, we have to...
Let's <laughs> switch to Jerry here. Let's yeah, switch to Jerry. Um, I'm going to go follow him around. How's that? Yeah. Yes, he's, he's not on the screen anymore. Okay, how do you do that then? Um, what did you, maybe you need to get rid of me. Okay, well, I think what we need to do is if you and I mute ourselves that, and okay. he says something, he will pop up on the screen. Okay. You're muted okay. now. Oops, yeah. Okay, we need to get Jerry back. I don't see him anymore. Um, he's on the attendees on the on the right hand side, Amy. So if you scroll down, you can see his camera. Yes, he is. He's on my main screen now. And I think I can hear him talking, but you can't hear much. Um, I found a way to do it. If I click the three buttons, the three dots that come up, and I said pin video, and now he's showing my whole screen. Yeah, you can pin him to the screen, uh, but if he... Why are you videoing me? <laughs> yeah, now I've got you, but if... Uh, this if he is would... a light switch. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. All right. Uh, We're going to go if, downstairs. If we... <laughs> If we have, some, if he has some commentary that, with Jerry. the video, he he will pop up on the screen for everybody. But you can also pin him to the screen. Nikki is now holding the phone. Yeah, she's going downstairs. Hopefully, she looks like she's being a. This is not help. working. It's frozen. Okay, no, it's not, it's working fine. Uh, that was a parrot, a parrot you just saw flying through the balcony. Um, now it's frozen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, how good this is gonna be. That's Pappy, our other very, very, very grumpy macaw. Ay, ay, ay. It's frozen again. This guy um, is called Babe, and unfortunately has a severe upper beak injury and uh, basically has no upper beak. We've had quite a few of these. Um, you know, it's... Uh, so long as we're careful with what, what we put in his seed tray, he, he fends for himself pretty well. You go, baby. All right. <laughs> Mary, do you have a problem with feather plucking? Not generally, because our birds tend to get a lot of um, interaction from other birds or from us. I mean, it's, it's it's normally a bored bird that plucks, you know, it just wants something to do. Um, we have received birds that do pluck, um, but once we get them, we've had quite a lot of success with uh, stopping it, and, and uh, we've actually seen quite a lot of feather regrowth in the birds that were plucked. I mean, we even had one bird in our early days who had eaten a hole in his chest. And just through constant interaction, uh, that healed up and feathered up again. So, um, you know, we, we don't tend to have a problem with feather plucking too much, although our cockatoo does actually keep back in. So, so yeah, it's that way. Our cockatoo doesn't like to have tail feathers. So, uh, there you go. 
That's Nikki wandering around again with Juju B on her shoulder. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to come back and take over from where you were? I don't know. Can do. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can shut that down if you yeah. want. Yeah. I should. I didn't go in the clinic and I didn't do the prep room because I couldn't hear anything. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to go do that, Jerry. It's up to you. Did you shut it down? Yes. Was supposed to leave it, but I, I don't know what's going on. If you want to go in the clinic or the prep room, okay, it's up to you. Well, yeah, the, the yeah. clinic and prep room would be great if we could. Take yeah, a Jer, I'm going to send Jerry because I'm I'm not very good with that, and I couldn't hear anybody, so I don't know if you were giving me instructions. <laughs> and then I got nervous. Oh no, I don't think anybody was talking. We were just watching. Oh, okay. Beautiful parents. All right. <laughs> yeah, this is, Juju was, um, she was like 10 years in a cage and she was a forest department confiscation. This was one of those, uh, they went back four times to try and get the guys to put perches in, just perches, that would be nice, but they wouldn't do it for some bizarre reason. They just said that she'll eat them and it's a waste of time, so they confiscated her. But she has this weird like woohoo thing on the wing, so she can't fly. And I don't know if you can see how crippled her feet are. She's got real issues with those. So we have to be careful with her weight because otherwise she gets arthritis issues. Yeah, so. But she's adorable. Doesn't know she's a bird. Do you birds? <laughs> so we get a few like that. So where are you, Jerry? And Karen's asking what kinds of disease issues are you dealing with? Okay, well that's something that I do in-house um, in the clinic. Um, I have got quite good at looking at um, poop samples and um, crop swabs and blood for um, fungus, yeast, bacteria and parasites. I lo 